Okay, so um, hi everyone. So good morning, good evening, and uh, welcome to the first seminar of the of the season. So today, as our first speaker, we have the pleasure to welcome Mernus uh, Tahani. So Mernus is uh, uh, currently uh, holds a Canadian National Banding Fellowship, uh, which is hosted at the Stanford University. And she is also a Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology uh, Fellow at Stanford. Um, before that, she was a research uh, associate, so a Covington Fellow uh, with the National Research Council of Canada at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory uh, from 2019 to 2022. And then um, she, she holds a PhD, which she obtained from, from the University of Calgary in uh, uh, 2019. So uh, Dr. Dahani is, is an expert on, on all things uh, related to magnetic fields uh, in the ISM. So today she's going to talk to us about the 3D magnetic fields of molecular clouds. So uh, uh, thanks again for doing this and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, so I'd like to start by <clears throat> acknowledging my collaborators uh, who have contributed to different projects that I will uh, talk about today, as well as my undergraduate students who uh, have uh, contributed to uh, some of the projects that I'll mention. Uh, so the topic that I'll be talking about today is observing the 3D magnetic fields of molecular clouds. And um, so my path to observing the 3D magnetic fields of molecular clouds was started by a new technique that we developed to determine the line of sight component of magnetic fields in molecular clouds. So first I'll give a brief introduction and introduce the method, and then I'll um, talk about the results from the method. And finally, I'll talk about uh, different projects that we carried out to reconstruct the 3D magnetic fields associated with molecular clouds. And at the end, I will very briefly discuss some of the current and future studies to better understand the role of magnetic fields in uh, the star formation process, whether they're acting as a friend in the star formation story, enemy or friendly. So uh, we know um, um, that star formation process starts in molecular clouds and uh, it's actually dense filamentary molecular cloud, as you can see with the yellowish color here that are the nurseries for star. So if you take a homogeneous cloud, as you saw in the simulation by Matthew Bates, and we perturb the cloud, the cloud starts evolving and it forms these dense filamentary structure, and then they collapse, they gravitationally collapse and form cores and stars. So obviously, gravity is an important parameter, but it's not the entire story. There are other parameters, as you all know, um, that are important in the star for formation process, and one of them is magnetic fields. So the first uh, observations of magnetic fields in the interstellar medium was started by Hiltner and Hall in an attempt to detect starlight polarization. So Hiltner, using his observations, um, said that the polarization that we are seeing in the data is actually due to the interstellar media. And then very quickly, Hall uh, looked at his observations and confirmed uh, Hiltner's, or simul simultaneously confirmed uh, Hiltner's hypothesis. And very quickly, Davis and Greenstein uh, attributed this to the alignment of dust particle with magnetic field, with the galactic magnetic field. And Spitzer and Taki um, associated this due to the ferromagnetic characteristics of dust grains. So we've come a long way uh, and um, 
uh, we have different techniques now to probe the interstellar magnetic fields, as you know. So the present techniques of detecting magnetic fields in the interstellar medium include Faraday rotation, uh, dust and starlight polarization, and Zeeman measurements. Faraday rotation has been widely used to probe the large scale galactic magnetic field. Uh, as you can see with the cartoon here, observed uh, or studied by Van Eyck et al. 2011 using VLA data. And Faraday rotation provides the line of sight component of magnetic field. And in molecular clouds, dust polarization, uh, starlight polarization, and Zeeman measurements have been widely used. Dust uh, and starlight polarization provide the plane of sky component of magnetic field, as you can see in the study by Fissel et al. 2016, uh, where the drapery lines here show the uh, plane of sky magnetic field as observed by dust emission polarization. Uh, using um, blast pole. And Zeeman measurements provide the line of sight component of magnetic fields, but because they require strong telescope, uh, they require strong magnetic fields and long telescope integration hours, there are not enough Zeeman measurements per molecular cloud available. So because of that, we um, developed a um, technique to determine the line of sight component of magnetic fields in molecular clouds based on Faraday rotation. So a quick recap on Faraday rotation. When a linearly polarized electromagnetic wave passes through a region, that is magnetized and has free electron, its plane of polarization rotates. And the amount of rotation is given by this formula, where, where lambda is the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave, uh, and E is the electron volume density, uh, B is the magnetic field, and DL is the path length. The quantity in parentheses is known as rotation measure. So if we have information about rotation measure, we uh, can obtain information about magnetic fields. Um, so in our approach for the sources that uh, provide the linearly polar polarized electromagnetic wave, wave we use extra galactic sources. So typically they're uh, radio galaxies, also some quasars as well. And the way that uh, people have used this traditionally to uh, um, determine rotation measure is by using the linear relationship between the change in the rotation and lambda squared. So if you observe at different wavelengths <laughs> and obtain polarization angle using the slope, we can find rotation measure. This is a classical approach but it gets the idea across. Um, so now to use this or further rotation for molecular clouds, we had to answer two questions. The first question is how do we decouple the galactic contribution from, from or how do we decouple the molecular cloud contribution from the galactic contribution? We know that the electromagnetic wave Pass, uh, passes through the entire galaxy from the source to the receiver. And the molecular cloud is just a portion of the path. So we need to decouple and determine the rotation measure contribution from the molecular cloud. And then after we found the rotation measure contribution of the molecular cloud, the second question that we had to answer was, uh, remember, in the formula, we had the electron volume density and path length. The second question is, how do we find the electron volume density and the path length? So I'll talk about these two in a bit more detail, but I'm skipping uh, some of the details. Um, and the reason that I like to talk about the technique and the details of the technique is that if you have 
any ideas uh, i'd be happy to hear uh, your thoughts or like possible collaborations on upgrading the technique even further so we've answered the first question by uh, dividing the integral into two parts the contribution from molecular cloud and the contribution from everything else along the line of sight or as i call it as galactic contribution. So the galactic contribution comes from a point like rotation measure point sources that fall near the cloud, but they are far enough uh, or far away from it that um, are not really probing the magnetic field of the cloud. So I refer to these points as off positions, as these ro uh, rotation measure points as off position and the rotation measure is rotation measure off. The on points are the points that fall on the cloud or near the cloud that they're probing the magnetic field of the cloud. And because the size that we are probing is relatively small to the size of the galaxy, they're relatively sampling uh, uh, the same path length. And we take a a uh, number of off positions and we study uh, the off positions thoroughly um, like how many off positions we need to get and so on so now what we are left with is rm on minus rm off gives us the rotation measure contribution of the molecular cloud and for this we've uh, used the rotation measure catalog of taylor et al 2009 uh, mainly uh, the rotation measure catalog of Taylor et al. 2000. And with this, we were able to answer the first question. Now, to answer the second question, we simplified the equations a bit further. We said that let's assume that the magnetic field, the line of sight magnetic field in the, excuse me, in the molecular cloud is roughly constant. And we took it out of the integral. So what we are left with is actually electron column density. So instead of finding electron volume density and electron column density, we just need electron volume density and the path length, we just need to find the electron column density. And to find the electron column density, we use extinction maps provided by Kainu Line and et al. 2009 and a chemical evolution code. Instead of extinction maps, hydrogen column density also can be used. So now uh, we have these two, like these three tools. Let's see how we answered the second question. So using the extinction map, we have a map of the region. If we plot rotation measure data on it, it looks like something like this. So we use blue to show magnetic field uh, toward us and they are associated with a uh, positive uh, rotation measure and red to show magnetic field away from us or actually here like on average like um like in the entire galaxy because we haven't approached uh, or we haven't applied the technique yet so blue shows magnetic field toward us and positive red shows magnetic field on average away from us and negative rotation measure. So if we have one rotation measure data point, if for simplicity, let's just follow one rotation measure data point. So uh, we have the location of that. So we have the extinction value and we have the hydrogen column density using a conversion factor. If we are using uh, hydrogen column density maps, we don't need this step anymore. And at the same time, we simulate the chemistry of the cloud. So for each cloud, this is different. And as input parameters, we have UV ionization rate, cosmic ionization rate, temperature, initial temperature of the cloud and initial uh, volume density. Then we let the chemical um, evolution code run. And as an output, we have the abundance of elements versus extinction. And one of these elements is electron. Um, so uh, using the extinction, uh, corresponding extinction for that very point, we have the electron 
uh, abundance of that point and using the chemical evolution code. So now we can, using the hydrogen column density, we can find the electron column density. And with that, we have answered the second question. And we can go back and plot the rotation or the, magnet, the final magnetic field results um, on the map. Uh, so the details uh, are explained in uh, our paper. And I, uh, I would be happy to answer any question regarding the details as well. So to examine the method, we picked four regions of Orion A, Orion B, California, and Perseus. And what we found was that whenever or wherever we had Zeeman measurements, our results were consistent with uh, Zeeman measurements or with molecular Zeeman measurements specifically. So here I'm showing the California molecular cloud no. Blue shows magnetic field toward us, red shows magnetic field away from us. And if we look a bit carefully, we see that at one side of this filamentary cloud, the magnetic fields are toward us, and at the other side, they are away from us. This reversal across the cloud, we also see it in Orion A. And this reversal with the exact same orientation was previously uh, observed uh, using Zeeman measurements. In Orion B, we do not have enough data points to uh, infer a reversal across the cloud. And Perseus as well shows an indication of this reversal across this cloud. Um, so, so far I've introduced the uh, technique and I've discussed the results. The main thing I'd like, to I'd like you to remember is that we developed a technique to probe the line of sight components of magnetic fields associated with molecular clouds. And in three of the regions, we found a reversal across these filamentary clouds. Um, so uh, the, I'd like to also mention that the code I previously developed to determine the line of sight component of magnetic field was um, updated by my co-op student, Jennifer Glover uh, at the National Research Council Canada, at, uh, the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory to run semi-automatically so we can observe a lot more clouds. And uh, mo even more recently, my other co-op student, John Ming No, uh, further updated the code um, to run uh, like for its full automation. So you can select many clouds and the code will run for many clouds. Um, the semi-automated version is already available on GitHub. The full automated version will be soon, uh, in a few months, available. And so before I get to other parts, uh, I'd like to pause and see if there are any questions. Hey, I, I have a question. Sure, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, Mendrus, uh, have you checked how the, um, how ma uh, do magnetic fluctuations uh, can affect this technique? Because you assume that it is constant throughout mm -hmm. the cloud. But... Mm -hmm. if, That's a really good Yeah, question. if it varies, I, I, I know this is a difficult question, but can you quantify it in some cases and see you know, how much it varies? Mm -hmm. That's, a, uh, that's uh, an excellent question. And one thing that all I can mention is that uh, we actually end up seeing the evidence of uh, magnetic fluctuations because, for example, when we get to the very densest parts of the cloud, 
for example, like the points that we had specifically in Orion A and Orion B, in the densest parts of the cloud, the magnetic field um, that we observe tends to be smaller uh, than the low density regions, which is opposite of what previous observations and theory says. And that's because in the densest, like very, very dense parts, we end up seeing a lot of fluctuations, but in the low density regions here, like surrounding the cloud, uh, we do not see like a lot of those fluctuations. So the magnetic field tend compared to, to those very, very like a, a big jump, like for example, like AV of one, two, three to AV of like 30 um, uh, two a magnitude, we end up seeing um, large magnetic field for uh, AV, uh, smaller AV and smaller magnetic field for big AVs. And that's because of exactly what you mentioned. Yeah, because, yeah. The, the, the problem that I see here is if, if the magnetic field is mostly in the plane of the sky, then uh, in the line of sight, you have the fluctuating component of the field, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in the, and in that case, if the magnetic field is mostly in the plane of the sky, fluctuations, we would change significantly along the line of sight. So right. my, 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 I think uh, this, appro this uh, approach of, you know, considering the magnetic field constant um, should be applied uh, preferentially in cases where you have some information that the magnetic field is mostly along the line of sight. Um, so, okay. So, uh, not necessarily like mostly. So if we have um, a like relatively coherent um, uh, magnetic field in a region and we can safely so basically like what we are probing is mostly the, the ordered components of magnetic field and um, so and the fact that we are seeing a reversal here and a coherent magnetic field, it shows that, yeah, like we are observing that ordered component and we can um, like take, like roughly uh, ignore those uh, fluctuations. So if uh, we have, for example, like a magnetic field that is mostly oriented in the plane of the sky, um like or like for example like the inclination angle of magnetic field is basically zero then yeah like the fluctuations uh that you are seeing is um like it would on average would end up being to zero and uh we are we are not detecting the fluctuations we are detecting average magnetic field the same thing goes for Zeeman measurements. Like if you're observing a localized uh, magnetic field for Zeeman measurements, you're um, like observing magnetic field on, on average uh, for that localized region. For our uh, technique, the localized region is slightly long, like larger. <laughs> but yeah, like if um, the inclination of magnetic field like gets higher and higher, then yeah, we are observing the line of sight magnetic field as long as we can say that there is an ordered uh, uh, component of line of sight magnetic field. If there isn't an ordered component of magnetic field along the line of sight, then yeah, we should get zero magnetic field. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if there aren't any other question um i'll continue i i i think i maybe maybe i should ask my question uh, hi uh, this is costasis i um, i wanted to i'm sure you have calculated this right but how um how how large is the difference on the plane of the sky i mean the distance between uh the 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 points the dots that you show in these maps? Um, 
the distance from these to the uh, center, like the axis of the filament, is that uh, what you are uh, uh, asking? Uh, so from, from let, let's say the distance from the red dot uh, on the upper uh, left corner to one of the blue dots on the lower part. Yeah, this is order of a few parsec. Okay, and this is like, Orion? This is California, so order of like two, two parsec, three parsec. Okay, so it's a, it's a few parsecs at the distance of California, right? Which is uh, what? Is it, is it like uh, uh, 300 parsecs away? Uh, California, yeah, like roughly 400 parsec. Okay, so this is, this is relatively nearby, a relatively nearby cloud, right? So, and you are seeing a solid angle uh, and you're, you're sampling the whole line of sight to extra galactic objects, right? The, are these uh, Faraday rotations from, uh, from quasars? For ex <clears throat> radio galaxies, typically. Radio, right, right, okay. So, so, so you, you trace the whole galaxy, right? Yes. Uh, so, so at the distance of, let's say, three, three, three kiloparsecs, right, mm -hmm. where you pretty much exit the galaxy, uh, the distance, the physical distance of these two rays will have diverged, right, by a factor of several. So, uh, presumably, you might be uh, sensitive to very different environments. In, in the deeper part of the ray, right? So when you do the on-off um, uh, subtraction, uh, how confident are you that you're, you are tracing similar regions of the galaxy so that you can you know, take off the rest of the galaxy and leave only the molecular cloud? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. So the main part of our confidence is come uh, from the fact we are seeing results consistent with Zeeman measurements, both in terms of orientation, direction, and, and uh, strength uh, for when we compare with molecular Zeeman measurements. Um, so that's the main uh, result that gives us the confidence that we have with these results. The other thing is that the on-off approach is actually a tedious approach. Um, like we have to apply several criteria and we have to make sure that we are sampling each side of the cloud and uh, we take a number of uh, off positions um, <laughs> and we actually um, like study uh, which is the best number of off positions very thoroughly. So the on-off approach is actually the most, um, even though the second uh, question sounded a bit longer, the on-off approach is the um, most tedious part of um, this analysis. And it uh, needs a lot of like user input as well. Um, and uh, I wanted to say something else as well. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, uh, I don't remember, but yeah, like the on-off approach, we end up taking a lot of points and study those points very, very well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your awesome questions. And if you have any thoughts on um, um, like uh, in potential improvements to the technique, we're actively working on the technique. I'd be more than happy to hear your thoughts. I'd be more than happy to collaborate. So please don't hold back. Um, all right, so um, now uh, we have these uh, reversals ac across the cloud and we wanted to study the 3D orientation or the 3D uh, magnetic fields of these clouds. So the first approach that we uh, took was using uh, only dust polarization data. So the three magnetic field morphologies that uh, can explain these reversals are toroidal, where magnetic fields form toroids around the uh, filamentary structure, helical, uh, or an arc-shaped magnetic field morphology. In the arc-shaped morphology, 
regardless of how the filamentary structure is uh, formed, the environment is thought to be responsible uh, to be interacting with the filamentary structure and bending them, uh, interacting with the magnetic fields and bending them around the filamentary structure. So uh, in case of the Orion A, where the previous Zeeman measurements uh, also observed this reversal, the environment that is thought to be responsible for this bending is the Orion Eridanus superbowl. So for uh, <clears throat> studying the 3D magnetic field, we used our line of sight magnetic fields and Planck plane of sky uh, magnetic field results. And we constructed models representing the morphologies that could explain this reversal. We obtained synthetic observations from our models and compared them with uh, observations using a Monte Carlo analysis, investigating a range of systematic biases and chi-squared probability values. And for the Orion A region, that was the focus of uh, this particular study, we concluded that an arc-shaped magnetic field morphology was the most probable morphology to explain the reversal that we were seeing, um, the arc-shaped morphology. So next, uh, we decided to use galactic magnetic field models to extend these 3D studies further. So in the previous study that I mentioned, we only conclude that an arc-shaped magnetic field morphology is the most probable one. And uh, we didn't really talk about the orientation of the arc or the direction of magnetic field. So we wanted to see whether with, with galactic magnetic fields, we were able to um, uh, obtain that information about the orientation of the arc or the direction of magnetic field. So, um, so we use galactic magnetic fields, particularly the galactic magnetic field model of jensen Farrar, our line of sight magnetic field results, and Planck plane of sky magnetic fields. And uh, with my uh, NRC co-op students, Wednesday Lupipchu and Jennifer Glover, we looked at the 3D magnetic fields of Orion A and Perseus. So here I'm showing the Perseus molecular cloud. Um, so the magnetic, the galactic magnetic field mod that we modeled, I forgot to show the arrow here, but it show it points from um, this direction, the left hand side to the right hand side, and it's perpendicular to the cloud, and it's mostly consistent with the Planck uh, plane of sky magnetic field observations, and uh, so. Uh, Using um, our line of sight magnetic field, uh, galactic magnetic field, and plane of sky Planck observations, the 3D magnetic field that we uh, inferred is concave from our point of view and points in the decreasing longitude direction. And again, this is the ordered component averaged along the cloud. So we are ignoring all the fluctuations that uh, you might see for particularly the 3D morphology. This is um, just the ordered component for the 3D. Um, so um, next, we could compare this. One, th one thing that I should also mention using alpha and mic number and uh, pressure calculations, we concluded that the galactic magnetic fields or the cloud also retains the memory of the uh, initial magnetic fields and in fact, the galactic magnetic fields. So uh, we can use this for um, uh, and compare our results with the predictions of cloud formation models. So one of the cloud formation model is the cloud formation model of Inutsuka et al. 2015, where a multi-compression scenario is needed 
to explain the formation of dense filamentary clouds, uh, which are typically generated by supernova. So this scenario predicts the bending of magnetic field around the form filamentary molecular cloud. So if we consider that a cloud is approaching uh, an H1 shell with the velocity V that has a component perpendicular to uh, the H1, and <clears throat> there is a magnetic field um, that has a component perpendicular to the velocity, then uh, we would expect to see a bending of magnetic field around the form filamentary structure. And they also uh, observed this in uh, their ideal MHC simulation. So if we have a 100 particle per centimeter cube H1 sheet and 1000 uh, particle per centimeter cube um, dense region, and we look at the interaction of these two, as a result, the magnetic fields are bent around the form filamentary structure. Uh, as the filamentary structure is formed. So if we take this in a very, very simple approach and say that, okay, if we know the initial magnetic field of the region, and if we know uh, the velocity uh, of the uh, dense cloud, then by um, using the velocity of the cloud and initial direction of magnetic field, we can predict the uh, line of sight uh, magnetic field orientation, and we can predict the um, orientation of this bending. So we can say that, okay, like in this case, the magnetic field is uh, concave and the magnet line of sight is pointing away from us at this point and toward us at this point. And the opposite case is true when the velocity is the opposite. So we decided to assume based on our often wave, uh, uh, often Mach number calculations that, okay, for these specific clouds, the initial magnetic field is the initial galactic magnetic fields, what the initial galactic magnetic field model suggests. And for the velocities, we use the CO, um, Tom Dame uh, CO survey and H1 high four pi survey velocities. And we assume that the cloud retains a memory of the most recent interaction. And uh, what we found that but we do have the galactic magnetic field direction. What we found was that the CO velocity in the H1 frame for Perseus cloud is pointing away from us. And this would, with the direction of galactic magnetic field, this would result in a concave magnetic field. And this would result in magnetic field away from us on this side and toward us on this side. And using this, we were actually um, um, able to uh, provide a more detailed formation mechanism for the Perseus cloud, uh, or hypothesize uh, a more detailed uh, formation scenario for the Perseus molecular cloud. So uh, in, in this approach or in this uh, uh, theory, we identify two structures that have contributed to the first disk cloud and its 3D magnetic field morphology. One is the giant shell that has been identified in different studies and different forms or, or shapes. Uh, for example, study by Bialy et al. 2021 or Bialy et al. 2008 which they uh, suggest have contributed to the formation of Perseus cloud. And then this large uh, bubble has resulted in a mild bending of magnetic field in the Perseus environment. But this mild bending, we do not really, we won't really be able to observe it in our line of sight magnetic field technique because it's very mild. You might have the opposite direction in the other side and uh, as we got like from, from questions asked by Raphael the uh, line of sight component is very small 
Um, so we need something that uh, contributes to the sharp bending exactly associated with the molecular clock. So we assume, we suggest that there must be another shock front that has um, uh, interacted with these uh, magnetic field and resulted in the um, sharp bending of magnetic fields directly associated with uh, this Perseus clock. And we identify using um, uh, 3D dust maps, uh, thermal dust emissions, CO uh, maps. We identify a structure behind Perseus cloud that could be what we are suggesting here that is uh, located in 3D as we can see here. And actually this a re more recent study by Konkel et al. Um, actually uh, suggests that that could be very well the case. Um, so for the Orion A, I won't talk about much about Orion A, uh, but we also uh, suggest that the magnetic field is uh, an arc shape and is pointing in the decreasing uh, latitude direction and is in this uh, uh, morphology. And it's mostly uh, <clears throat> concave from our point of view. Um, we also carried out MHD simulations to uh, see whether we can, because we're still curious about helical fields, and we wanted to see whether it's possible to generate helical fields or we end up getting um, arc shaped fields still if we take an isolated filament. So we used FLASH, which is a high performance, publicly available, multi-scale, multi-physics simulation code. And we took an isolated uh, cylinder and we uh, had different parameters um, and explored a wide range of parameter space. Uh, including rotation to the filament. Um, and in none of these cases, we were able to see a helical field, which we expected based on what the results that we got. Uh, but when we introduced velocity profiles along, uh, across or like perpendicular to the filament with uh, an undergraduate student at the National Taiwan University, we were able to see evidence of uh, arc-shaped magnetic field morphology. Um, so this reinforces our conclusions again. So just a quick uh, summary so far, we've developed a technique to pro uh, provide the line of sight component of magnetic fields associated with molecular clouds and our plane of sky, uh, combined with line of sight and galactic magnetic fields uh, suggests that uh, the complete uh, uh, 3D magnetic field uh, morphology for these clouds, uh, but the ordered component of magnetic fields. And I've discussed these and the caveats of, um, I think it's important that we Every new technique, we also talk about the two caveats. So I've discussed these in a new um, review paper. But in the uh, review paper, one of the things that I also discuss is how the 3D observations can be improved. And that would be possible with uh, new and improved line of sight magnetic field observations new and improved plane of sky magnetic field observations. So we can um, get a better understanding of the origin of uh, filamentary molecular clouds. The two molecular clouds that they mentioned and talked about their formation scenario, Perseus and Orion A, are nearby clouds and are in a simple region of the galaxy. So this could be an accident that they are consistent with the Inutsuko et al. 2015. Uh, so we need a lot more clouds. Um, and using these 3D fields, hopefully be, we'll be able to um, better understand the role of magnetic fields in molecular clouds. For line of sight observations, um, the new and improved techniques uh, or new and improved observations will be uh, possible with the upcoming um, 
SKA or on the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, uh, as well as uh, VLA observations. Um, and <clears throat> previously, um, I also have actually uh, data from the Synthesis Telescope at the Dominion Radio uh, Astrophysical Observatory, which will improve the observations in uh, some regions. For the plane of sky uh, magnetic field observations, I'm particularly excited about the Fred Young Submillimeter Telescope, which will make observations in many more molecular clouds with high uh, uh, resolution uh, and sensitivity. And in addition to these, uh, observing the starlight or dust, dust extinction polarization will enable us to, um, as uh, people in this crowd know, uh, will enable us to get information about different clouds along the line of sight and improve the accuracy and precision of these uh, 3D studies. And with that, I'll just leave my summary slide. I ended up speeding up a bit at the end, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manoj, for this uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Um, uh, I see people are clapping, so I will just make the sound. Uh, so um, are there any questions? Um, so please uh, just raise your hand or just uh, speak up. So I see Rafael has some questions. So Rafael, you can go ahead. Yes, okay. Thank you, Marnus. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this nice uh, talk. I, I, you mentioned that you, you use the Alvenk Mach number in combination with uh, your line of sight method, right? Yeah, that was just to uh, say, like, that was just to say whether the mm -hmm. clouds retain a memory of the initial magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So that was then an essential part of the, the reconstructing the 3D magnetic field, but mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so, so uh, okay. So my question is, um, how do you obtain the Alvenic Mach numbers? Because uh, for, from my experience, I, uh, I think I found this uh, estimates really hard and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, the estimate is an estimate and it's difficult. So for the selection of these clouds, we were lucky that both Perseus and Orion A are very well studied. There, uh, there were uh, lots of velocity observations available, um, but this is still not a 3D often like number. Um, so we are limited with that, but uh, we are like looking at like a specific range. So, but that's true. So, so is it uh, the estimates that exist are the based on dust polarization methods like the uh, Sadrasekar Fermi method? No, no, uh, they're uh, pure, like for the alpha and Mach number, they're purely like spectrometry observations. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, just a note on that, you know, mm -hmm. with the method that we proposed with Costas uh, mm -hmm. uh, for estimating the uh, magnetic field strength, you, you mm -hmm. can obtain some estimate of the Albanian Mach number in the plane of the sky, at least. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just for... Uh, uh, that would be a good comparison. On yeah, a good comparison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> other questions uh, for our speaker? I, I actually have a very simple question about uh, uh, the telescope that you showed in the in the last uh, oh, slide, okay. the synthesis telescope. Is, is that still operational? And uh, 
Oh, this one. Uh, has it been updated recently? And uh... it is still operational, and it will undergo a major operation uh, very soon. A major upgrading. I don't know what the proper word is, but yeah, it will be upgraded uh, very uh, soon. Are, are there any plans to like uh, connect it with uh, Chime or? Uh... Um, this one hasn't been connected to Chime or I don't know of any plans to be connected with Chime, but the the other telescope at the like one of the other telescopes at the uh, uh, observatory, which is the twenty six meter or John Galt, has been used uh, with the uh, Chime telescope. Okay, thank you. We're building something very similar here um, in, in Crete, so that's oh, why awesome. I'm, uh, I'm interested. Is it an um, interferometry or? Yeah, it will be very similar to um, to this to this one. Um, oh, cool! Interesting. Uh, all right, so I see eyes. Uh, yeah, may I also ask a couple of questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hello. Uh, hope uh, temperatures in Canada still remain at a reasonable level. Uh, I'm in California now. Ah, you're I'm in California now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the first question was, um, have you tried applying this method to simulations to, to test its validity? Mm. So uh, I'm in the process right now. Um, I have some MHD simulations uh, by the Enrico Vasquez Samedani's group, and I'll be uh, uh, applying the technique uh on those simulations uh, like i'm working on that right now but if you have any other simulations uh, and would like us to test the technique on that i would be more than happy to to do so yeah i do have 3d simulations you know so yeah, if, if you if you want them just please feel free to drop me an email and awesome. this Second question was, um, would the results be consistent with, let's say, not a filament, but a, a seat-like structure with um, uh, 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 my mind stuck. Uh, so we, with our glass morphology magnetic fields? Oh, okay. Um, so are you talking about the uh, arc shape morphology? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, like, are you asking whether, uh, whether, like, maybe I'll show uh, this arc shape morphology or like the reversal that we are seeing can be explained by the hourglass morphology? Is that the question or? Yeah, whether this reversal could also be consistent with uh, an hourglass magnetic field. That was actually, I thought about quite a lot. Um, because, yeah, like in a lot of the simulations, uh, when we had a dense filament, uh, like isolated filament, a, a morphology that we kept seeing was an hourglass morphology when we had just an isolated filament. And so because we would see like two different um, direction along the line of sight, um, and because uh, like that would cancel out along the line of sight, unless there are a very um, like large inhomogeneity along the line of sight, we won't really see any uh, like average along the line of sight reversal. And because the uncertainties of these points are large, and still with the uncertainties, we are seeing the evidence of this reversal. Even if we have a large inhomogeneous structure, I don't think it would be visible in our line of sight observations. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any final questions for our speaker?
it's going three, uh, two. I'll also four. mention that if you have any criticism of the technique, anything that'll help improve the technique, so please do let me know. Okay, uh, so uh, um, thank you very much, uh, honey. I'm, and I'm sure more people will reach out to you once uh, the recording is uh, online. And uh, thanks again for accepting our, our invitation. And uh, hopefully we can repeat this uh, again at some point and ideally in person. Um, ideally, yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. So, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye.